Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to uh, UAF Summer Sessions and the um, final uh, University of Alaska Press Authors Corner event of the summer. Uh, this evening, we're very lucky to have with us Thomas Alton, uh, who will be sharing from his UA Press book, Alaska in the Progressive Age, a Political History, 1896 to 1916, and uh, about his experience researching and writing the book. Um, thanks uh, in particular to those of you who are here at uh, UAF's Engineering, Learning, and Innovation Facility for attending. Um, before we go any further, I want to say that uh, we acknowledge here uh, at UAF and in Fairbanks the, the Alaska Native Nations upon whose traditional lands our communities reside. In Fairbanks, our city is located on the traditional lands of the Danak people of the Lower Tanana River. We cherish the land on which we live and depend, and we honor and respect the people who came before us and who are still here. I want to be clear, it uh, looks like we have complete compliance. Um, UAF has uh, re-implemented a strict COVID-19 policy requiring face coverings and social distancing inside all buildings for everyone, vaccinated or not. Um, please get vaccinated. Thanks uh, to those of you who are tuning in uh, to the live stream or to the video recording later on uh, from Alaska or anywhere else. Um, thanks for your interest and your attention. Um, thanks also to the University of Alaska Office of Information Technologies, um, Scott from Zuto and JC Ice, who's here with us tonight. Um, thanks to Michelle Bartlett and Summer Sessions for organizing these fun and stimulating summer event series for your charge. Uh, and thanks also especially to tonight's presenter, Tom Alton, and all UA Press authors for agreeing to participate in this reading series this summer. Um, I hope you'll make it worth their time. Uh, you can find more information in the purchase link for Tom's book, Alaska in the Progressive Age, uh, at the UA Press website, which is alaska.edu slash UA Press, for those of you online. And I also um, will have copies for sale after Tom's presentation tonight out in the lobby area. I think he um, may also be willing to sign copies for anybody who's interested. Um, I also believe we'll have some time for questions uh, at the end of Tom's presentation, so please consider any information and details you'd like to hear more about um, as you listen, and, and uh, I will have the microphone to pass around for any questions in the room. For anybody on the live stream, please use the Google form link below the video pane that you're probably watching right now. Um, the address for that form is um, bit.ly slash author Q&A, that's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash author Q&A, no spaces. Also, um, yeah, I think that that's I was going to say we'll post the schedule for the rest of the events, but I think that we're nearing the end of our program for this summer. So, um, without any further ado, Thomas Alton um, long worked as an editor at the Alaska Native Language Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and uh, also after that at the International Arctic Research Center, which is where I first met him and where I did my best to fill his shoes as science writer and editor when he retired in 2011. Uh, he continues to live and write here in Fairbanks. Uh, he contributed to uh, another UA Press book, The Tanner of Chiefs, Native Rights, and Western Law. Uh, and he published Alaska in the Progressive Age in 2020 uh, and was um, quickly and sub subsequently awarded the James H. Ducker Alaska Historian of the Year uh, for 2020 by the Alaska Historical Society. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Thomas Holt. Thank you, Nate, and uh, I want to thank you and your staff for an excellent uh, and very uh, smooth uh, process of uh, publishing my book. Very well done. Um, so the book is Alaska in the Progressive Age, uh, 1896 to 1916. I've often been asked, um, why those years? If you're going to write a history of Alaska, why carve out those years for, uh, um, uh, for to focus on? And uh, my answer is that I've always been interested in that period of time. It's, it's, a, it's the 20 years in which Alaska really grew. The modern, uh, it was the beginning of modern day Alaska. It's, uh, I can take this off, I think. It's um, the 20 years when um, uh, there was a system of judicial system that, that came into place. Uh, there were systems of transportation and communication developed. 
and all the many of the modern cities we know today had their beginnings during during that time after right up following the gold rush in 1896. Before that, Alaska was pretty much unknown. There was quite a bit known about the Aleutian chain and Kodiak Island and the southern Kenai Peninsula and the Alaska Peninsula and, uh, and southeastern because of Russian occupation and uh, because of a lot of uh, tourism in the last part of the uh, uh, 19th century. John Muir and others, their travels to the southeastern but when it came to the interior, the vast uh, uh, interior, it was uh, uh, virtually unknown. It was as unknown and mysterious as darkest Africa. Uh, it was terra incognita. And, and uh, so that was, uh, this was the period when, when growth really began to happen in the, in the interior, the years after the gold rush. Uh, and as I began reading more about this period of time, I got wondering about the political context uh, that uh, in the national uh, politics, what was going on in national politics at this time. And I soon discovered it was the uh, era called the Progressive Era that coincided perfectly with that 20 years, uh, 1896 to 1916. There was an era called the Progressive Era. And uh, so, uh, what was the Progressive Era? Well, I guess in a nutshell, you could say it was an age of reform. It was a time uh, during which um, new uh, uh, protocols were put into place to regulate uh, business and, and, uh, and commerce. Uh, the last decades of the 19th century were a period of rapid growth, uh, industrialization, and uh, massive uh, migrations from off the farm into the cities and uh, new, new jobs in factories and mills and, and, uh, and giant corporations uh, developing and combining. And, uh, and it happened so fast that uh, government regulation and oversight uh, just didn't keep up. There was, uh, there was th this development without any um, uh, oversight or regulation by, by federal government. So the progressive age was a, a period of time that uh, where there was an attempt to, to, um, to, to catch up uh, with uh, regulation. Uh, corporations were operating, uh, uh, and they were combining and, for, and forming monopolies and finding that they could uh, improve their profits by combining and, and, and controlling prices and, and, uh, and working conditions and wages. And uh, so let me just uh, read from my uh, introduction to my chapter on the roots of progressivism. The progressive era had its beginnings at the turn of the 20th century, formed out of the social and economic turmoil of the 1890s. It was a movement of people who represented the full spectrum of class and politics, but were united by a few core convictions. That large corporations had grown to such size and strength that the government of the people had no mechanism in place to regulate them. That wealth had become too narrowly concentrated in the hands of a cluster of robber barons of industry that the masses of workers in the fields and factories endured miserable conditions and possessed little or no opportunity to prosper, and that big business interests controlled the workings of government at all levels. Even as Americans reelected the unwavering conservative William McKinley to a second term in, 18, in 1900, reformers from both major political parties moved to correct social injustice and restrain the avarice of corporate monopolies under the system of direct regulation. And this is the, this is the point and strong central government was seen as the agent of change. Progressivism was a product of labor strife and depressed economic conditions that prevailed at the end of the 19th century. In its ranks were devout, dom Democrats, devout Democrats who were joined by former populists in support of the persuasive liberal leadership of William Jennings Bryan. Republicans came on board in response to leaders of their party, such as the newly elected Wisconsin Governor Robert La Follette, who exposed the corrupt influence of corporate power brokers at the state and municipal levels. Across the board, progressives feared that large corporate trusts, particularly the railroads, had the power to monopolize sections of the economy, thwart competition, and dictate consumer prices. Only a strong federal government had the authority to enforce regulations that would protect, protect the free and open marketplace. Many believed that American democracy itself depended on it. So that was uh, progressivism. So what, what does that have to do with Alaska? How did Alaska fit into this, uh, into this um, uh, context of uh, the progressive era? And uh, 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 it's so it, it just so happens that Alaska had its own version of a 
monopolistic, strong corporate trust, namely the Morgan Guggenheim Alaska Syndicate. Uh, the Morgan Guggenheim Syndicate was formed in 1906, and the primary purpose, its primary purpose in life, was to mine uh, uh, copper ore from the Kennecott mine 120 miles inward, in, inland from Prince William Sound. Uh, they came together. Uh, the Kennecott copper ore deposit was discovered by a group of, of uh, uh, prospectors and who recognized immediately the, the huge wealth that was uh, stored, uh, stored there in that, uh, in that deposit. It was a world-class copper ore deposit. But they knew right away that uh, it could only be brought to, uh, to market uh, by the best miners of the world, the best mining companies in, in the world, and an investment that only the richest financiers of Wall Street could afford. And thus the combination of the Guggenheim Corporation, Guggenheim Company, and John Pierpont Morgan, Morgan of uh, New York. And uh, so they, uh, uh, they, com uh, they combined and, and they um, set up uh, their mining operations. Soon they built a railroad, the Copper River Northwestern Railroad, uh, to service the mine, uh, to bring in supplies and, and labor, and to bring out the copper ore. And soon they owned uh, the Alaska Steamship Company. They needed ships to ship the ore to the Guggenheim smelter in Tacoma. And uh, they had their fingers in just every aspect of, of, Alaska, of the Alaska economy, many other uh, smaller businesses and uh, types of businesses. And they controlled uh, pretty much all of, all of the Alaska economy over uh, before, before a period of time. Came to Alaska in 1900. I, I mentioned earlier that there were new codes of uh, civil and criminal justice uh, that passed by Congress. Uh, one provision of, those, uh, of that legislation was the establishment of three judicial districts in Alaska and with a judge uh, in, uh, uh, for each, each one of those judicial districts appointed by the president. Uh, James Wickersham got the appointment from uh, William McKinley in 1900 and uh, uh, to be the uh, judge for the third judicial district in Alaska, seated in Eagle. And uh, here's James Wickersham arriving in Eagle in the summer of 1900. That's him in the middle with his wife, Deborah, on, on his left. And, uh, and there he is, uh, James Wickersham, age 43, of Tacoma, Washington, arriving. And over the period of the, re the rest of his life, the next 39 years, uh, the rest of his life, he uh, devoted uh, to Alaska and uh, became, uh, uh, served several more years as district court judge and then was elected uh, territorial delegate to Congress in 1908 and served uh, uh, seven terms as, uh, as, ter as territorial delegate. And uh, I've, uh, I, I've I'm always uh, Im um, impressed by Wickersham. Uh, I've argued uh, in, uh, previously that uh, if there were an award for the Alaskan of the first half of the 20th century, it would be James Wickersham. He's, the, in my opinion, the most prominent and important Alaskan of the first half of the 20th century. So he was elected and he served uh, as federal district court judge until 1907. Uh, and he uh, had faced, he faced tough reconfirmation uh, uh, hearings uh, every two years. Uh, he had uh, to be reappointed every two years, and he had, worked, had uh, built up a, a number of pretty prominent enemies, and uh, one in the Senate in particular was Knute Nelson, the, the uh, senator from Minnesota, who was the chair of the uh, Senate Committee on Territories, uh, who had a particular dislike disdain for Wickersham for several reasons. And uh, uh, so by 1907, Wickersham was not eager to go through another bruising uh, reconfirmation uh, process. And so he resigned as judge and set up a legal practice in Fairbanks and uh, was, was doing quite well. And uh, I should uh, mention also, yeah, I uh, skipped over this. Uh, James Wickersham was one of the first uh, arrived in Fairbanks as one of the first uh, people in 1903, April 1903, uh, he arrived in Fairbanks, and this was Fairbanks. He's in a half dozen new log cabins, a few tents, and a rough log structure with spread eagle wings that looked like a dis disreputable pigsty. I love that. It wasn't just a pigsty, it was a pigsty with a bad reputation. 
and that was Fairbanks as I first saw it on April 9th, 1903. And there's another view of Fairbanks in 1903. And there, uh, in 1904, Wickersham moved the uh, seat of the third judicial district to Fairbanks from Eagle. And uh, that's what really solidified Fairbanks as the um, population and city, uh, uh, permanent city in, in the interior. Uh, before that, there was a lot of competition with the little town of China, uh, um, at the, uh, where the China River flows into the Tanana. But uh, this, uh, Wickersham's decision to, to move the, the courthouse to the court to Fairbanks uh, really solidified Fairbanks. Um, so he was, uh, uh, he set up, he, uh, he retired from the um, judgeship in 1907, set up a legal practice in Fairbanks, was doing quite well. And, uh, and all of a, not all of a sudden, he'd always had a, a strong interest in politics, but uh, 19, early 1908, he uh, decided to uh, run for the delegate, uh, position of delegate uh, to the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. That office had only been established in 1906 uh, uh, with a, a lot of struggle and work by uh, Alaskan advocates in Congress. They finally passed uh, the, the uh, delegate uh, law in 1906 and elected the first uh, delegate. It provided for one non-voting delegate to represent the Alaska Territory in the House of, U.S. House of Representatives. And uh, the first uh, election was held, it was, the law passed early in 1906 and, uh, and the first election was held in August 1906. They held two elections, one for someone to fill the seat just for the remaining few weeks in that term, and then another election for the, to fill the full term coming up uh, starting the next year. And the first uh, person elected was a name, man named Frank Waskey, uh, who filled the, the short term for just a few weeks, and then the, the full term was, was won by a man named Thomas Kale. And uh, so uh, uh, Kale, when the re-election came up in 1908, uh, Kale kind of wavered about whether he was going to run, so Wickersham decided to, to jump in. And, uh, and it was a big um, uh, bruising battle, and uh, uh, as Alaskan frontier politics was. And uh, the uh, biggest issue was um, the issue on the minds of all Alaskans, the one that was universally uh, favored by Alaskans was self-government in the form of a, an elected territorial legislature. And Wickersham had been kind of all over the board on this. He had given a speech the previous fall that said Alaska wasn't ready for a territorial legislature, that it was too, too soon, there wasn't enough population to support it. And, uh, and, and then he had given a, another, um, uh, well, that was in, in a, he'd written a letter to the uh, Alaska governor saying that Alaska wasn't ready and he'd given another speech saying that Alaska uh, was uh, absolutely a, a, in favor of a territorial legislature. So the papers just jumped all over that, especially the Fairbanks Times, and uh, just really um, uh, was very much, very strong uh, uh, coverage and editorials against Wickersham. But uh, Wickersham won uh, the election in 1908 and just to give you an example of uh, journalism of the, of the day, of the age, I love the, the, the journalism of the early 20th century. Uh, but uh, uh, after the election, in the end, Wickersham's positive name recognition, ar recognition around the territory served him well. He won decisively in Fairbanks, Nome, Valdez, Skagway, Juneau, and Sitka. In Cordova, where the Alaska Syndicate exercised considerable influence, the voters overwhelmingly chose another candidate but the overall total favored the former judge by a considerable margin. Uh, still, in the rough world of frontier politics, Wickersham's critics would not be silenced. And this is the quote that I love. We are, we are not going to, this is from the Fairbanks Times, we are not going to fall over ourselves to congratulate him. An election cannot turn black into white or make an angel of a sinner. As to Wickersham, the politician, we shall bury the hatchet only in his vitals. <laughs> so that's, that's frontier journalism for you. Uh, so Wickersham goes to uh, Washington in, uh, following his election in 1908. And uh, again, the, the big issue is um, uh, um, 
uh, uh, self-government for uh, the election of a of a um, of a uh, an elected legislature for the territory. Uh, and he had a, a lot of enemies, um, he, and he had um, his. It's during this time, during the election of 1908, that his persona as a as a um, absolute hater of the Alaska Syndicate uh, was really uh, really grew and developed. Before that, he was he he uh, had good friends within the uh, the upper echelon of the Alaska Syndicate, uh, even on cordial terms with some of them. In fact, in or before he decided to run, he wrote a letter to the syndicate asking, proposing that he be their general counsel. And uh, they turned him down. They said, no, we've, we've found someone else, uh, another law firm to represent us. And, uh, and Wickersham said, well, that's, that's just a, a business decision. And he was, he was fine with that. In fact, the, the other law firm uh, uh, signed a contract for less money than Wickersham was willing to work for. But then, uh, after he decided to get into the race, he wrote another letter to the syndicate, uh, his friends uh, who were higher up in the Alaska syndicate, asking for their endorsement in the, in the race, and they turned him down. They said, no, we've, uh, we've decided to support someone else. And that is what uh, tore it for Wickersham. That, that was personal. The, 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 the legal representation was business. This was a personal uh, matter, and he took it personally. And he, from then on, he swore he was the sworn enemy of the Alaska Syndicate. It was a, a mantra that, that lasted the rest of his, his life in politics. And uh, so when he goes to Washington after the election, uh, his b biggest opponents in the fight for a territorial legislature were a lobbyist for the Alaska Syndicate. And what rankled so much in Wickersham and, and Alaskans in general so much was that the, Wicker, the uh, Alaska Syndicate was not only a monolith in, in, uh, in the economic uh, system of Alaska, but they had this powerful political muscle that they uh, flexed and were, uh, they, they went to Washington and fought against everything that was in the, the best interests of, of Alaskans as far as Wickersham was concerned. Uh, their, one of their um, main lobbyists was a man named Wilds Richardson, who was the uh, head of the uh, Alaska Road Commission uh, uh, and uh, the man for whom the Richardson Highway is named, and, uh, and uh, the governor of Alaska, a man named Wilford Hogat, uh, and uh, Wickersham almost came to blows with Richardson, and, and uh, Richardson kept um, uh, referring to himself as, as representing the, the will, the needs of Alaska, and, and, and Wickersham said, you know, just really uh, was disgusted with, with him for, for saying that, and, and uh, uh, they got into <laughs> real, real um, disputes. And uh, so um, let's see what I have here. Uh, oh yeah, um, the, just one more indication from the press of how, how strong the animosity toward the Alaska Syndicate was. There's this quote, back of Alaska's demand for more political autonomy is a fight to save the vast region from the clutches of the Guggenheims. <laughs> Already the monopoly has placed its grasping hand on the territory. It is the menace which threatens the wealth and freedom of competition in Alaska, and it is ably aided and abetted by financial interests that center about J. Pierpont Morgan. So Alaskans liked the, the jobs and the economic, you know, where, where, where the syndicate provided jobs, they were all in favor, but, but it was the political arm that, and the muscle that they, exerted uh, in politics that, was, that really uh, upset them. Wickersham works on the, uh, the Alaska um, self-government, uh, and uh, he had a lot of support in Congress from other uh, progressives. Uh, uh, Taft was president by this time, and Taft was all in favor of an Alaska uh, territorial legislature, but he wanted it uh, to be appointed. He wanted the members uh, to be appointed. Uh, Taft had been governor of the Philippines, back in the late 1890s. And uh, that's the model they set up in the Philippines, was a locally, local uh, legislature, but with um, uh, members of the legislature appointed by the, by the governor. And uh, Wickersham and Alaskans would have nothing to do with that. That was absolutely abhorrent to them, because they knew who would control the legislature. It would be the, the Alaska syndicate would, would control the legislature in that case. 
So he fought against that, and to his credit, uh, 1912, uh, he won, and, and Alaska won, the territory won, a, a self-elected um, territorial legislature uh, in, uh, in 1912. Um, then the next uh, issue after that, um, Wickersham uh, won elections in 1910, 1912, and uh, 1914. And then the next uh, big issue uh, to come along was the Alaska Railroad. And uh, that was by that time, it was really being, being talked up. Uh, and uh, it was becoming a, becoming a major issue. And it was, it was the main thing that, uh, that uh, Wickersham worked on after that. Uh, and uh, uh, the Alaska Railroad, again, the, um, the Alaska Railroad bill was fought, fought by, the, uh, by the corporation, by the syndicate. And uh, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll read from my beginning of the chapter on progressivism and the Alaska Railroad. Progressivism was the incubator of the Alaska Railroad. In 1912, it created the ideal climate and provided the perfect conditions that allowed the project to take form until a living being was born two years later. This, the prospect of financing, constructing, and operating the railroad gave progressives in Congress plenty of reasons to lend their support. It would open vast areas of mineral and agricultural wealth in a land that was owned collectively by the American people, but many people believed had been managed poorly. It would build an efficient means of transportation from a tidewater port to the interior, creating jobs and opportunities for the working public. It would demonstrate the progressive conviction that government at its best was an agent for progress and improvement in people's lives. The government railroad made a statement of the strength of federal regulatory control in the area of, era of popular reaction against the power of corporate trusts. It would occur in a place where the giant Alaska syndicate owned by some of the richest financiers in the world threatened to monopolize every sector of the, the economy. This project would be a model of progressive democracy at work. And it was, and the, the battle in Congress uh, lasted uh, for two years, and uh, it, Wickersham had, had plenty of, of progressive support. Uh, and the, the president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, at the time, and said Alaska as a storehouse should be unlocked. A railroad is a means of thrusting in the key to the storehouse, throwing back the lock, and opening the door. That was Woodrow Wilson in his State of the Union in, in 1913. Uh, he had uh, other support um, from, uh, and, and the arguments uh, to today, some of them are almost, uh, almost laughable. Uh, they're, uh, they, they, uh, the Wickersham and his progressive supporters uh, based their arguments on two things. One was the was the power of the the trusts, the monopoly. The, it was a, the the, uh, um, the the question of whether the government would be in charge or and or whether a monopoly would control everything. And uh, his quote when he's arguing in, on the Senate floor: "Government or Guggenheim, which shall the territory be con controlled by its constitutional trustee or by the trusts? Shall it be owned by the people or by monopoly?" Shall its resources be open to acquisition and use by the pioneer prospector and home seeker or unfairly monopolized by one great syndicate? And that was the crux of his, his, um, his argument. That, uh, if, the, uh, if the government did not build it, it would be built by, uh, by the monopoly, by the, by the hated evil uh, syndicate. The other argument they used was that uh, Alaska would be opened up by a, by a railroad all the resources that just lay, were just lying there waiting to be exploited, uh, the mineral resources, coal, gold, and, uh, and others, and then the agricultural resources, that, uh, uh, that agriculture was, uh, was just waiting, waiting to be developed. Uh, and uh, the, some of, they, they really um, used some, I guess the word is grandiose arguments to, to tout the, the agricultural uh, potential of the Tanana Valley. Uh, they, um, uh, uh, there was one um, uh, colleague of, of Wickersham's um, that uh, was uh, touting the agricultural potential of the Tanana Valley in the most glowing of terms, comparing it favorably to the farming regions of Alberta and Saskatchewan in Canada and in, and in Montana. They have sunlight until 10 o'clock at night, he proclaimed 
and in addition, the frozen ground keeps continually giving up its moisture for the support of the plant life above. Thus, the frost below actually aids in the growth of the, growth of the vegetation. The result was that the growing season sprouts, grows, and matures at a pace that is scarcely conceivable to those who reside in regions farther south. <laughs> and that's, that's laughable to us, but uh, the, the Congress bought it. And, uh, and uh, they uh, predicted um, uh, uh, population in the hundreds of thousands immediately and eventually within years in the, in the, ten, in the 10 million that it would, it would support a population uh, as large as that of Northern Europe, which is on the same, uh, same latitude as Alaska. And uh, so, um, yeah, the, uh, so the railroad bill uh, passed in 1914. Uh, Woodrow Wilson signed it into law in March 1914 and uh, immediately uh, construction uh, uh, started. Uh, the fatal uh, flaw, the, uh, of course, we all know that it, that it uh, did not bring all that prosperity right away. Uh, the cost, the, the or, uh, original appropriation from Congress was $35 million. And that, uh, they, they went through that uh, very quickly, went back to Congress for more, and, and by the time uh, the railroad was completed in, in 1923 with uh, the final thing to be completed was the Mears Bridge across the Tanana and Nenana. And uh, when that was finished and Warren and uh, G. Harding came and drove the Golden Spike, there was still uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work to be done to replace uh, wooden trestles with concrete and steel and uh, to uh, improve the, the ballast. The, the, the line from uh, Ninana to Fairbanks was uh, was narrow gauge, so that all had to be uh, uh, rebuilt uh, to a standard gauge. And um, they, the railroad uh, purchased uh, for uh, I think 1.2 million dollars the, the uh, Northern Northern Central Railroad out of Seward that had been started out of Seward and went broke 71 miles north of Seward. So they bought that and, and extended that, and then they bought the Tanana Valley Railroad. And which, uh, uh, and, uh, and so work started and from both ends, north from, from the north and from the south. And, and uh, so uh, it was uh, uh, completed and um, it, uh, uh, it did not, um, right away it was, it was a pretty much of a financial failure. Uh, and we know that over time it, it uh, uh, with World War II and, and the, all the, the gold dredges and, and the mining in, in the interior that it finally became a, go, a profitable concern. But, uh, but the, the, um, uh, it was interesting, the, uh, uh, there was a, a lot of people who wondered uh, why the, um, the uh, federal government should step in in a place and build a railroad where the, where the private industry would not, uh, would not do it. And uh, there, was a, there were very few arguments uh, but a, f a few people brought up the point, well, there has to be a population that the railroad can serve. It has to, um, uh, it has to uh, provide the means of transportation, and, but it has, there has to be an existing population. And you can't just go the other direction. You can't build the railroad and then expect that to bring in the population. The population has to, has to be there to begin with. And uh, uh, there's a quote that I love from, uh, 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 James J. Hill, the great uh, railroad uh, magnet of the um, Great Northern Railroad. And uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, uh, um, uh, a railroad in the Garden of Eden with nobody there but Adam and Eve would be a poor investment. <laughs> and uh, you know, he is, he's exactly right. Alaska might have been the, poor, the Garden of Eden, but to build a railroad in the Garden of Eden is, is not going to not going to bring a profit. Uh, so um, in the middle of all of this uh, uh, excitement, when um, uh, James Wickersham comes back to Fairbanks in uh, May of 1915, and uh, Fairbanks is just uh, beside itself with excitement over this, this new railroad. It's going to turn Alaska, it's going to turn Fairbanks into the, the quote from some uh, promoting company, the Chamber of Commerce type. So it's, it's going to be the, the Chicago of Alaska. And uh, so uh, Wickersham uh, comes and he sees all this excitement. 
And he's, uh, so he goes on, uh, on, a, on a trip out to the Minto Flats and the, Tana, and the Tolavana River. And uh, he's uh, very much uh, concerned about the Im impact that this is going to have on the uh, Alaska natives uh, of, the, of the interior. And uh, so he goes uh, searching for um, uh, native people to consult with and talk to and warn them about what's going on. He's, he's, uh, and he uh, notably runs into Chief Alexander in, in Tolavana at the uh, mouth, mouth of the Tolavana River at his, his camp. And he warns them of the uh, impact that this railroad is going to bring to, uh, to, the, uh, to the native people of interior Alaska. Uh, uh, Athabascan people had uh, lived here in this uh, area for thousands of years. And uh, the uh, progressive view of, of uh, Native Americans was that they really, they, did, they were uh, not even thought of. They were just very rarely even, uh, very uh, not even thought of. And, uh, and, and the, the land was an, was an open country, just there free for the taking. And they had no concept that the land was not, you know, just just uh, unoccupied. Uh, but that's uh, the way they saw it. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, Chief Alexander uh, took uh, Wickersham's words to heart and uh, and got together with a number of the uh, other chiefs of the Tanana uh, River, all the way up river to to uh, Salchacket and all the way down to uh, Crosschacket and Ninana. And uh, they um, organized a meeting. Uh, for uh, uh, and, and they got together on, on July 15th, and uh, they met in, in Fairbanks, and uh, this is uh, Wickersham and Chief Alexander in Tolavana on that trip. And uh, uh, this is a picture I'm sure all of you have seen many times, but uh, uh, they uh, the meeting came together. And it was held in the. Uh, the library building that's still standing on the corner of, uh, of First and Cush and uh, Cowles Street, and uh, and it was on, on July 5th, 1915, and uh, Wickersham uh, sitting there in the in the middle, behind him is, is a man named Thomas Riggs, who was the chief engineer for the uh, northern section of the uh, Alaska Railroad, and uh, Wickersham warns them the man, the white men are going to take all this good land and when all the good land is gone. The white men are going to keep on taking more land. After a while, the Indian will have no land at all. And Riggs, after the railroad which we are building comes into this country, it will be overrun with white people. They will kill off your game, your moose, your caribou, and your sheep. When you have land, when, uh, when you have land either in a reservation or a homestead, you will have something of value, something you can live on, something on which you can work always, make, make a living by work which not be too hard. But uh, Wickersham and Riggs were pushing a system uh, onto the, uh, hoping that the uh, Athabascan people would form a reservation or accept uh, uh, individual 160 acre allotments. And uh, they, they said, uh, they got together and uh, they said nothing doing. Uh, 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 Chief Ivan of Cross Jacket, we don't want to go on a reservation but wish to stay perfectly free just as we are now. Chief Alexander, Tolavana. We are people who are always on the go, and I believe that if we are put in one place, we would die off like rabbits. So, um, Wickersham, there was a uh, was a dilemma for Wickersham. He walked walked into that meeting uh, expecting to have all the answers. He expected uh, the the, um, the native people to accept uh, what he had to offer uh, and without any any question. Uh, but then, when they uh, rejected him. He um, was, uh, it was a, I'll, I'll just uh, read from that section. The meeting left Wickersham at a loss for answers. As a product of his times, he was fully immersed in the view of the frontier uh, as seen as an open country, mostly uninhabited and free for the taking. Wickersham went into the meeting expecting to mediate a settlement that would leave the natives satisfied with the land occupation, occupancy options the government had to offer. When they rejected him at every turn, he was forced to come face to face with the complicated reality of native claims. Where the government was concerned, there was no negotiating to be done. The railroad had its right of way, and the project was going through with or without the Indians' approval. But for the first time, 
Wickersham saw the undeniable history of Aboriginal occupation of the land and the natives' close, intractable cultural and spiritual connection to it. Turner's, the, the ethnocentric view of the frontier proved to be too simplistic and a land claim solution that would be acceptable to natives as well as non-natives was nowhere in sight. On July 22nd, Wickersham mailed a transcript of the meeting to the Interior Secretary Franklin K. Lane along with a cover letter. This is his letter to Franklin K. Lane, the Interior Secretary. Uh, along, with a, um, along with a cover letter that expressed his ambivalence. Will you not kindly read this record and consider what ought to be done for these people before all the good land and fishing sites are taken up, taken up by the white men? It was a dilemma that Wickersham would never solve. He was caught between the progressive imperative for development of the frontier and his sense of sorrow for the losses that would surely be felt by the Athabascan people. He believed in the government's duty to open the frontier and allow miners and farmers to populate and develop the land, but at the same time, he lamented, lamented the impact such progress would have on the native way of life. It would be more than a half century before an agreement was reached with, with passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971. I could just add that the progressives um, have been uh, criticized for their uh, views or their treatment of race. They were, they were very uh, uh, proactive in reform uh, of uh, social and economic and, and, uh, and so forth, uh, those kinds of, and, and uh, labor reform. But when it came to, uh, to uh, minorities, African Americans and Native Americans, they had a, a very poor record. Uh, I'll en uh, end with this um, uh, quote uh, about, um, uh, from a, a congressman when they're debating the Alaska Railroad. Fairness and justice for racial minorities was of no concern to most progressives in the plan for progress and development of the nation's far north territory. Here's the quote. It will be strictly a white man's country, a member of the House Committee on Territories proclaimed in hearings on the Alaska Railroad Bill. The conditions there are such as will be most favorable to propagating and developing a race of white people. And the best blood of the world will thrive and find a natural home in Alaska. Could you explain the relationship between Bob LaFollette and Judge Wickersham during those years? Oh, yeah. Well, La Follette was the leading progressive of the day. He was a uh, uh, Wisconsin governor and uh, pr put a lot of his progressive ideas into, into action in Wisconsin. Um, and, and then he was elected senator from Wisconsin in, I think, 1905. And um, so I'm not real clear on whether Wickersham and La Follette had any uh, close connection. I know that um, in 1912, when the Progressive Party was trying to mount a third party candidacy for the presidency with, with uh, for, uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, as, the, um, as the candidate, uh, Wickersham went to the um, uh, Progressive Party convention where they nominated Roosevelt as, as, their, as their candidate. And, um, and La Follette was, was one of the, the leaders there. So I know La Follette was a, a big supporter of uh, uh, and that was right in the middle of, of Wickersham's fight for, for home rule for Alaska, for the territorial legislature. And I know that uh, Wickersham and, uh, had the support of, uh, personally, from Roosevelt and, and from La Follette on that issue. I was just uh, wondering if you could summarize uh, Wickersham's uh, retirement and when oh, yeah. he moved to Juneau and so on. Oh, yeah. He moved to Juneau. Uh, he served um, in terms, uh, he was elected in uh, 1908, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18. The, uh, the elections of 16 and 18 were disputed. Uh, he um, the, uh, uh, was declared the loser in 1916 by uh, something like 35 votes. And he immediately uh, contested the results of the election. And there were many irregularities that, that showed up. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, voter eligibility. And uh, so he fought that. And, uh, and uh, meanwhile, the person who, the, who had been declared the winner took the, took the seat in Congress. His name was uh, Sulzer, William Sulzer, took the seat in Congress while the fight, the dispute went on. 
And uh, in fact, the dispute was not settled before the 1918 election came along. And uh, so the, the same thing happened in 1918. Wickersham ran against the same Salzer, and uh, Salzer was declared the winner by, again, a handful of votes. And so he, did, he contested that one. And so the, both elections were, up, were under, under contest. Um, and finally, they declared Wickersham the winner of the 1916 election. And so he got to go to Washington and take the seat for a matter of, you know, a, a few days before the session was over. And then uh, the uh, winner of the um, 1918 election uh, took the seat. His name was Grigsby. And no, I'm sorry, uh, Salzer won that one. But then Salzer promptly died uh, in uh, June of uh, 19, um, uh, after the 19, of 1917. And uh, so then they held a special election, and Wickersham sat out that special election because he knew he would be declared the winner in 1918. That's when this Democrat Grigsby was elected. And then, subsequently after that, uh, they finally declared Wickersham the winner of the 1918 election. And uh, so he got to, got to take the seat again for a very short time. Then he was done. He'd, he'd had it. He was, he, was, uh, he was a bitter old man by that time. Uh, in fact, I, uh, one of the favorite, one of the funny quotes uh, Wickersham took to uh, uh, venting his, his uh, anger at, at former enemies. And uh, he, um, the, uh, the grueling contest had taken their toll. Wickersham biographer Evangeline Atwood concluded that, that at the end of the, de the end, the delegates showed little enthusiasm for the job and then he took to venting his anger in a number of attacks against old political foes. Moved by bitterness and frustration, Wickersham resorted to personal revenge, lashing out against any and all he would consider. Among his targets were Thomas Riggs, uh, I pointed him out, now serving as Alaska's appointed territorial governor and Secretary of the Interior, Franklin K. Lane. Riggs um, uh, had long been considered by Wickersham to be in league with the hated Alaska syndicate. And in the latest two elections, Riggs had, act Riggs had actively campaigned against him. Now Wickersham, and this is uh, Riggs's quote, like the cur that he is, <laughs> accused, <laughs> accused um, uh, Riggs, uh, Wickersham, like the cur that he is, uh, accused Riggs of incompetence in his role as railroad construction engineer. So he was, he, he was uh, finished with politics and uh, moved to Juneau and uh, lived there uh, the rest of his life, but he was reelected uh, he decided to run for a, another term in 1930 and, and won that and, and served that uh, two-year term beginning in, in, after the election in 1930. Then after that, he uh, went to his home in, uh, in Juneau and died in 1939 at age 83, I think. Uh, well, I, I have a question, Tom. I mean, it's a, it's a, um, it's a really captivating uh, picture that you paint of the time period. And, it is like easy to kind of live there and stay there, but I'm also, I, I guess I also feel compelled. I, it's, it's hard not to draw some connections to the world that we live in mm -hmm. today. So mm -hmm. I wonder if there are um, both of them, I guess maybe on the national stage, but maybe more importantly in the state, if there are lessons that you think that we can draw from this time period. Mr. Well, we're uh, looking at the same kind of a situation. Our economy is dominated by one industry. And uh, there are a lot of uh, repercussions in, uh, 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 of that, you know, uh, uh, political and social uh, repercussions of, of the dominance of one, one single industry. And it was probably more um, uh, evident in, in 100 years ago uh, with, with the Morgan Guggenheim syndicate because that was all there was. Uh, today we have a little bit more diversified economy. We have other, other things, fishing and logging and, and, uh, and uh, some other industry, but, but um, yeah, you can you know, draw some, some uh, connections there of, of the, uh, the uh, political and social uh, consequences of, of uh, dominance of, of one, one industry. And, and the, uh, we, we certainly have seen the uh, effects of the uh, political muscle that, a, that a, 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 a single industry can, can bring to bear. Um, One other thought, I'm, I'm amazed at the closeness of the elections back in 
early 1900s, and then I, you think of the local elections today, I think of a number of years ago, Mike Kelly, one vote, mm -hmm. um, uh, Bart Levon, yeah. it, it's, it's incredible how close mm -hmm. it's, and which speaks to the dynamic, I think, in the, right. in the Sidless thing. Yeah. All of Wickersham's wins were just razor thin, and, you know, just uh, uh, right, real close. And it's yeah, it's it's continued to today. You know, we just, every every election is just within a matter of you know a few votes and, and on the national stage. We're seeing that uh, the same kind of um, uh, closeness in the percentage of, of people who are uh, vaccinated compared to non-vaccinated. You know, it's, it's the same uh, percentage as the elections. Yeah, okay, well, um, I, th I, I hope you'll uh, help me thank Tom here. Th thanks again. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. There, there's a few minutes left before eight, so um, I'll be out in the lobby for, for anybody. I hope you're interested in the, in the book and, um, and and you know we'll have a couple minutes to chat with, with the author and, and with each other here if, if people want to stick around. And I want to thank audiences for the entire summer for, for coming out for the Authors Corner and for the other um, lecture series here. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know, Mike. Is, are, there, are there other lectures this week? Or? I think that's it. Okay. Um, all right. Well, well, thanks again to summer sessions, and thanks again to everybody here and everybody who's tuning in. Um, it's been a it's been a good and fun and dynamic and engaging summer. So, um, and you know we're we're in we're, it feels like we're kind of in the fall season. So, thanks for thanks for coming out and thanks for supporting uh, the press and and um, and the second summer sessions and, and the university. Um, it's good to see everybody here and uh, hope to uh, hope to see you again next year. <laughs>